So hi, thanks uh, Bilam for hosting uh, us. Such a great pleasure to, to speak about my art. So I'm uh, Jules, I'm a French artist based in uh, Montreal. And uh, before getting into visual, I, do, I did a lot of um, audio stuff. So I uh, did some study in uh, science and musicology, and then uh, a master in uh, computational uh, music. And uh, during my study, I discovered uh, the, uh, I would say, audiovisual field. So I got into uh, visual through uh, first Isadora. So I did like this piece. It was made from uh, data from the, the wind at the top of the Mont Everest during uh, eight days. So uh, the visual and the sound are produced from uh, the acceleration, direction, the speed of the wind. And then uh, I got into processing. I did this kind of uh, visual from the uh, algorithm, like this one as well. And then uh, I um, was uh, blocked into uh, like the offline rendering, I would say. So I moved to mm -hmm. touch designer in 2017, I would say. And um, during the, the pandemic, I had the opportunity to, to work uh, on the software for almost uh, two years uh, every day. So I did this kind of uh, mapping installation or uh, little uh, experiments. So also during the, the pandemic, there was a, an open call from a, a, a gallery from uh, Krakow in Poland who, did, uh, who asked for um, artists to do uh, 360 pieces. So it's, that's the way I, I, um, I discovered the 360 visual, I would say. So it was uh, the Fontation Photon. They have uh, a gallery with, uh, I, if I do remember well, that's a 12 meter uh, wall and you have 10 projectors uh, projecting on all over the, the surface. So I did some experiments to, uh, to try to, to create a, like immersive visual. It was kind of tough because it was my first experience uh, with 360 visual. But uh, at the end, I found that the, the better way to do it is to render the, the visual uh, in the equirectangular uh, format. So I did my first uh, film, uh, 360 film, which is uh, Troublant Trou Noir. It means uh, strange black hole in English. It's a, a French title. So I um, worked from the Lee Smolin theory which says there is probably some universe inside the black holes. So um, the, the, the film, it's like a journey from um, one black hole to another, and you, you go through, uh, through a, a universe. So here are some pictures of the, of the place. And uh, right after that, there was a, a call, from proposal, call for proposal from uh, SAT, which is Society of Art and Technology uh, in Montreal. They have like a, a big dome, 30, 13 meters high uh, dome. So I adapt the piece uh, for, uh, for, for SAT and I got uh, accepted and uh, projected during uh, three or four months in the dome. So here are some, some pictures of it. I really liked the, the way uh, the surface really treats the mind and it really creates some, uh, some perspective and uh, yeah. And the, the, the year after, like uh, this year, I did my uh, second uh, movie, which is uh, Synthropy. So Synthropy is the opposite of Entropy. Entropy uh, is the principle of uh, like things tend to, to go to a, a cha to chaos and uh, synthropy is the opposite so uh, things tend to to organize themselves to create some uh, organized structure i would say 
So here is, here is some picture of it. So basically, I was going from really organic shape and slowly they, they organize themselves to, to create those kind of buildings or those, those shapes. So now I'm going to show you uh, a basic uh, under setup in Touch Designer. Or for, the, for those who don't know how to do it. So I just, uh, it's quite a simple setup. There is a sphere moving in a in circle and going uh, up and down. So to get the, the DOM project sent render, I would say, you just need to uh, change your render mode to fisheye and rotate your camera to 90 degrees on the x axis. So you, your point will and translate it to zero. So your camera will, will, um, will be towards the y axis and look up this way. So you get this kind of, uh, of render. You could also uh, render it in a dual parabola. And then from there, you take the projection uh, top and go to fisheye and move it 180 degrees. And you get quite the same uh, render. It mirror, but it's the same. So here is the same uh, render setup with flex. I just took the uh, operator uh, in the operator snippet. I took uh, like the ball uh, example that we hit and instead of moving the, the sphere in, uh, in the space, I'm just moving the, the gravity like in the same principle. It's going uh, in round and uh, up and down and it creates this, uh, this under. A really useful tool is uh, inside dome. If you want to pre pre visualize your um, your video in a sort of dome, you can find it uh, on internet. It's like apply uh, the um, the fisheye view to, uh, to to the dome, and it works pretty well in my opinion. So then I'm gonna share with you some tip and tricks uh, I found uh, all the, all the, all, all on, on the way, I would say. So first, there is spatial media metadata injector. That's a, a little free software to, um, to insert uh, the metadata. So you can uh, use your video in YouTube, for instance, or in VLC, which is also capable of uh, read uh, 360 visual. So you just have to uh, render your, um, from fisheye, you use the projection top and change it to equirectangular and move it like to minus 90. You render this, uh, this visual and then you inject metadata and you will get uh, exactly the same that uh, inside DOME in YouTube. So that's pretty uh, useful if you want to, to share your 360 visual. It's really easy to use. Like you just click on open and then uh, inject metadata and it creates the file. Also, uh, there is a, for, for sound, I recommend to use a, this uh, Max for Live device, it's envelope for live. You can uh, take uh, any object, uh, sound object, and uh, specialize them. Uh, yeah, it's really useful. Or uh, there is also this uh, this tool by Eric Renault. It's called uh, XP, and uh, it's really uh, useful because you can um, take uh, like coordinate of uh, of objects from touch designer and uh, use, uh, use them as uh, automation to, uh, to specialize the sound. It works quite well. And, uh, here, here is some uh, festival I, uh, I participate. 
So if you have a, a film, feel, feel free to, to share uh, with those uh, open call. Like there is a Sapfest, my company festival, Dom UK, uh, Orstus uh, International Film Festival, Domfest West, Culture Lab. Uh, you can find uh, also a lot of call for proposal for Dom uh, project on Film Freeway. And there is a, a lot of useful uh, information uh, on the full Dome database. It's quite a, a nice site uh, if you want to, to get into uh, 360 visual. And uh, that's it. Here is my contact if you have some question. And uh, I think we still have a little bit of time, so I can show you a bit uh, of my uh, of my last film. So there you go. So as I said, it started really like um, really organic. And slowly it goes to some more organized shape. Also, I, I found like a, like there is different type of dome. There is like a 180 degrees dome. And for instance, at a Society of Technology and Art in Montreal, it's a 210 degrees dome. So I find uh, really nice to put uh, the horizon line at uh, 180 degrees. So it really creates a perspective angle and it really tricks the mind. So you feel really in a, in a kind of a space, which is uh, unnatural. Yeah, it slowly go to more squared uh, organized uh, shapes. And finally, uh, go to this kind of uh, the shape. Yeah. So that's it. If you have some uh, some question, uh, feel free to ask. And uh, cheers. Okay. Nice. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about. Uh, where to find a dome when you don't have access to a dome. Um, and I'd like to um, start out first giving a little bit about myself. Um, I'm primarily a digital fabricator. Um, I'm a user experience designer in my day job, uh, but I work a lot with steel. I work a lot with all sorts of different materials. Um, this is not a dome that I made. This is a Buckminster Fuller dome, um, but I work um, building domes uh, at times. Um, and a lot of times I'm building apparatuses for performers. So at some point those two things uh, will merge. Um, all right, so uh, to add to the conversation of uh, where do we find um, places to show and to um, observe work in domes, I'm working on a little bit of a community map. Um, with this map, what I would like to do is uh, open it up to anyone who wants to contribute to it. I'm going to go ahead and put the link for this in the chat. Um, that way you can take a look at this map. Oh, I don't have a link for this up right now. I'll give you the link for this after the talk. Um, so I'm going to close my slides out. But um, there are not a lot of spaces um, in uh, either science centers or within um, just arts spaces that offer artists the opportunity to come in and um, pr like prototype and test content. So um, just having an archive of those spaces is helpful. In addition to that, um, there's going to be a section in this for different residencies, if there are residencies available, um, and any other support that uh, these spaces can provide artists. So started that map, I will share that with you at the end of the talk. Okay, um, but how did I get into all of this? Um, I credit my uh, good friend, Monica, uh, one day she told me that I should build a dome and she had been um, involved in the dome community in Colorado with an organization called Immersa. Um, and if you aren't familiar with Immersa, you should be, especially if you're in the dome world. You can screen your work there, but also they offer a lot of workshops um, on techniques and content. So it could be anything from spatial sound to cinematography for domes. Um, highly recommend following them. Uh, they haven't, they do an annual conference. Their conference was um, in October. And um, 
if you're if able to make it out to that, it's in Montreal. I think they're going to probably do it again, maybe in Colorado, but I'm hoping that they go uh, out to Berlin or they go out uh, uh, across the sea. Um, <laughs> that would be quite nice. Okay, so um, uh, so from there, my friend Monica said, Jen, you should build a dome. And I looked up a dome calculator, um, just happened to have bought several uh, small, these are 2000 lumen projectors. Um, and I called my mom and I said, Hey mom, I said, I'm going to build a dome. I need a bunch of PVC pipe or something. And she's like, don't buy a stick of it. I have about a thousand feet of PVC. You can have them. Uh, so we drove to Ohio, met up halfway between Nashville and, uh, Ohio where or the Northeastern part of Ohio, where she lives. And, and I collected a thousand uh, feet of PVC. Um, and I then wondered how I was going to get a screen showed up in a maker meeting and. Uh, one of the guys at the meeting just happened to have, uh, I think he had 12 panels of uh, four-way stretch screen. I lived in Nashville at the time. Uh, when conferences and shows go out of there, they throw out a lot of stuff. So we got a bunch of upcycled fabric and we built a dome. Um, so this dome was built in 2015 um, with the support of the makerspace there. Um, and as you can see, uh, KT and I are down on the floor uh, that's before we made a single cut of the dome screen. Um, so it took two of us uh, 18 hours in a tiny little apartment to surge um, a essentially 32 foot dome screen. Um, and I can give you tips on that if you would like to learn how to make your own, which is not the easiest task, but it was fun. Um, so um, this is the team that put it together. Uh, we're prototyping it uh, in the backyard of the man on the right. Uh, that is Matt. Um, and he was one of the founders of the makerspace there. Who, they were gracious enough to support the project. Um, and if you go inside of it, you notice how it kind of puckers. This is not the ideal way to build a dome screen. Um, it looks like a giant marshmallow inside because it has like these kind of bulbous um, kind of points inside. I wish I had better photos of it. Um, but it will go up again and I will be sharing that in the future. Um, so we needed a stand to put it on. When you have a dome, it's helpful to have um, kind of the, 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 the viewer should be as central as you can possibly get them if possible. And it's helpful to have that full range of vision kind of around your head. So we wanted to make sure that we had the, the full, the actual dome part around um, a little bit more at eye level for the user. And we didn't want the projection to obstruct um, um, or be obstructed by people sitting inside the dome. So we made a frame for it. Um, and this got installed an event, at an event called Modular Art Pods. Modular Art Pods is an event where people construct four foot by four foot or eight foot by eight foot cubes. Uh, and you're supposed to crawl through them. Uh, they have all sorts of different artistic content. So they let me place my dome at Modular Art Pods. And this is the result. Um, don't love the look of it necessarily. I think it looks like a giant wedding cake um, or a giant cake, but um, but it's functional and it worked um, for what we did. Uh, covered the dome poles with, uh, I think we just took like sheets because when you have to buy things at this volume and you're doing it on your own budget, um, that's, uh, you know, you get fabric as cheaply as you can. Sheets at Walmart work fine for that. Um, so within this dome, we had uh, three electronic musicians we had live theater performances from White Orchard Theater, and we also had swing dancing, uh, which was quite fun. Um, and Monica did the sound for that. So she did an eight channel speaker array and um, the dome was built by myself and the team at Make Nashville. Okay, so um, how was this all set up? So this was pre my understanding of Touch Designer. Uh, so this project was mainly um, pre-rendered content that went through QLab. Um, and then was uh, fed into siphon to Omnidome. Omnidome is only available for Mac. So um, if you're looking for a free option to do your dome uh, mapping, I would suggest getting two computers, one of them a Mac, uh, or a Mac just spout it to uh, over to Omnidome or just, you know, you can um, send your signal to the other computer and run that if you need a free um, configuration. But we ran that through a triple head, that's their recommended setup. Um, and we did a three projection system with those three Epson power lights that I had. Um, okay, so if I were to do this today, uh, slightly differently, uh, there are slightly different tools available. Um, so Touch Designer would be my tool of choice. And from there, you would just render it as we've seen in the previous talk. Uh, either in a dome or a rectangular format, uh, go through either Siphon or Spout, depending on your operating system. Um, and uh, Blendy Dome VJ um, is the other option for Mac that is uh, 
pretty handy for mapping. Uh, but there's recently been, um, and recently, I think it's maybe four years old, um, Nest Dome out of um, Montreal has uh, a mapping software. It's about $800 for a license of it. Um, hold on a second, here it is. Uh, let's skip the slide. Um, so what this will automatically, this will let you do, dome mapping is like the worst part of having a dome, I will tell you. I have spent like six hour periods trying to map a three projector dome, uh, not knowing what I was doing. Uh, with, with Nest, all you need is a 180 camera or a 360 camera. Um, it'll align dots automatically for you. Um, so if you have two projectors, okay, fine, you can get by without it. But if you have three or more projectors, this is the way to go. Just buy a license and use it if you're gonna do this in any serious capacity. Or if you have a long-term installation, um, it's super quick, it's super convenient. And also Patrick, the guy who uh, has developed this is super supportive. He is um, it's kind of a one-man shop and he, uh, when you call him up, he will help you through your um, your install if you need it. Um, okay, so for projector coverage, again, um, if you do a pro two projection system, um, you probably have something small or you have very, very bright projectors. I don't recommend this because at the edges, you're going to get some distortion. Um, in the dome that we built for uh, the modular art pods event, we did three projectors. Um, if you do not have ultra short throw projectors or really short throw projectors, you might have to do four projectors. Um, and this would be how you would lay that out. So you would do, you know, you three projectors on the side and one up in the middle so you can get kind of, get more maximum coverage. And I haven't op optimized these, these are just a graphic uh, for reference. Okay. Um, Nope, I got to put something out of line here. All right. Um, so for your considerations when you uh, are setting up in a dome, so you have your surface area. Uh, so what kind of dome do you have? You have a 180 degree dome. How big is that circle? How big is that circle around? Is it 270s? 270 extends below, you know, a flat horizon line. Um, do you have a partial dome? Some domes are a wedge or just half a sphere. Um, you have a flat or tilted dome. In science centers, you often have stadium seating on an angle. Um, that's, a, that's a tilted dome. Flat domes are like your old traditional planetariums or like the sad. Uh, seating, you can have planetarium seating, which is like all the seats around the outside edges. You can have stadium seating, which is all at an angle. You can have open seating, which is like kind of the bean bags that the sat you saw in um, some of the earlier presentation pictures. Or you can have no seating, you can just have people standing. Um, and I'm sure there's more configurations for seating. Uh, you can put, put a stage in the front, whatever you'd like. Um, next question is, do you have performers? Where are they gonna go? The ideal place for a viewer is in the middle of the dome. So, you know, you can put performers there, but you're really, you know, taking away from that experience of the uh, viewer if you do that. So you need to consider those things. Lighting, I didn't put that on there, but lighting in a dome is very difficult. Um, one of the interesting things that was presented at Immersa this year was the discussion of how to use um, the color and the light from the projection to light your performers because you can't really put lights in a dome very effectively. Um, it just washes out the image. Uh, so if you do have performers, you need to be thoughtful about your lighting. Um, so graphics and resolution. If you're doing a DIY dome, um, you're a little bit limited. So resolution in a dome, like 2K is like 2K by 2K because it's, it's square. You have a dome master. So you have to look at like, what can your computer handle if you're, especially if you're doing real time um, or if you're pre-rendering everything, um, what's your deadline to get the thing done and your resolution um, and what kind of graphics are you, are you actually trying to produce? Because some of these things can really slow down your computer, especially if you're doing, um, some domes go up to uh, 8K. Um, if you're trying to do 8K out of a computer real time, good luck. Um, <laughs> so you need to kind of weigh that and then, um, you know, and then of course your projectors have an entirely different resolution, but um, if you render things a little bit higher than your projection resolution, they tend to look a little bit nicer. Um, at least they have in some of the tests that I've seen at Immersa. Um, okay, so I am um, uh, gonna shift off of um, that section of dome building. Um, so maybe you can't build a 20 foot dome. Uh, maybe you can only do something smaller. Um, so I found an architectural dome uh, in salvage at ba in Baltimore. Um, this is a project that I will be working on in the future, just as a small prototyping dome and possibly a dome for outdoors that can uh, be permanent, that is weatherproof, that I can just, you know, bring projectors outside, you know, on a nice summer night and, and uh, watch films. 
um, and then Puck, uh, which is a, um, this is a dome made of chloroplast and Velcro on the corners. These are, uh, there's five pieces of material here, or six, I think there's six pieces, and they all get Velcroed at the corners. It all folds up quite nicely. This thing packs flat, um, and we put that on a frame, and this is actually at South by Southwest uh, uh, EDU in 26 or 2017, Phil Liddell and I ran down and, and did that um, kind of a fun event. That was a two projection dome. You can see how low the projectors are in there. Uh, the difficulty there is that people's shadows get in the way when you do a smaller dome. Uh, but if you're prototyping at your house, so uh, my point with these smaller domes is if you're gonna make things for a large dome, um, you can make people sick if you move too fast. You can make, uh, you can create some sensations that are, are unsavory. And similarly, you can create some wonderful sensations of motion, um, but it's helpful to actually be able to put yourself in that space and not just look at it on a flat screen so that you can do that. So um, I'm gonna keep working on some foldable prototypes here. That way there are some options available for people to, um, you know, do their own, uh, you know, at home domes. If you have two projectors, you can make it work. And so you can prototype your dome content. Um, but I am working on reinstalling some of those. I've recently moved um, and getting those back up and going. Okay, um, so uh, your other option is you can rent a dome if you have a festival or you have something you need to set up at. This is my friend Ralph's dome. Um, this was at Kindling Arts Festival uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, this is this kind of shows just like a regular setup with the seating. He had three projectors in there. His are mounted higher. His projection doesn't go quite to the ground, uh, but it worked quite nicely. We had a nice concert performance on the ground by a group named Gardening Not Architecture and other performances as well. Um, and finally, um, you know, um, it's hard to find people that are into this. Um, so at Immersa, one of the years, we had a bunch of friends just hanging out in the hotel room, and we thought, you know what, we should. Uh, make our own residency. And so we did that. Um, I'm working on finding the footage uh, for this particular thing because we're going to put together a reel for it. Um, but we did an artist residency where we hung the dome. Uh, there were some exposed beams. Uh, we hung, this is one of Ralph's domes. We hung that, um, did a, I think we did a three projection system in this one. And um, Monica did sound again for it. Um, and we put aerialists uh, in the middle of it uh, on a floor uh, based apparatus. Um, and over the course of a weekend, we prototype the story on some visuals. Um, so, um, you know, uh, if you got a friend with a warehouse space, take it over for a weekend, put up your dome. Uh, if you don't have a dome, um, you know, see if there are, you know, within the dome community, especially immersive, see if there are other enthusiasts that you can get a hold of. Um, and, uh, you know, or get a hold of me, I'll show up in any city and set up a dome gladly. Um, but uh, you know, if you, if you don't have access to it, make it. Um, okay, uh, so I wanna say thank you. Um, you can get a hold of me at any time. Um, this is one of my favorite topics is building domes, I'm working on larger scale installs. So if you have questions on fabrication at all, um, please do reach out. Um, and I guess with that, uh, I'm gonna turn this back to Billy. So thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. and. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, again, I think we're going to save them to the end, but uh, feel free to put them in the chat too. And I can, and I will share that link to that map as well. So thanks. Okay. Um, so you're muted. Unmute myself. Yeah. And um, so today I'm going to talk to you about like my experiences with domes and how I got to the point where I am, where, I, where I've had the possibility of working uh, with domes uh, several times. So first of all, I'll, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Daniel Shambo. Um, I'm originally a designer and I worked um, a lot in theater, uh, doing animation, and set design, um, and also quite a lot of interactivity. I started also with processing and Arduino, um, and it's been a fun journey. Now my favorite tool is Touch Designer for being able to connect lots of different things. And yeah, let me see if I can just move this out of the way. 
Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about my experience working here in Bogota, Colombia. I'm from uh, South America, and this is the planetarium we have in the city. It's the biggest planetarium in, in Latin America. It's 23 meters in diameter, and it's a 360 degree projection, and the dome is 180 degrees. So back in 2018, I had the chance of working for this full dome festival we have here in Bogota, which is called the Moyeno. And they basically uh, invite lots of artists from all over the world. And so my job back then was to uh, receive all the videos and change the codec uh, of those videos to be able to work with the system that they had at that time in the, in the dome. And this was my first time working in the Dome Master format. None of the videos were mine, but I got to see all of the content that they were gonna show before. And afterwards being in the event, meeting the artists, I had a blast. And afterwards I was like, okay, I have to try something like that. And um, there's this, um, grant that they have in Bogota, which is uh, like a small grant that gives you access to make a full dom video and then you can be part of the national uh, part of the festival. So next year, 2019, I applied with a friend of mine uh, to the grant and we actually won and I want to show you like the prototype thing we sent Nowadays, like, it's not very good, but it was my first attempt at doing something for a dome. As you can see, um, this doesn't have like proper mapping and it's got like an ugly seam in the middle, but we were just trying to experiment and see what we could come up with. Um, I think we also got a little bit lucky because we actually won the grant and we got to develop our film for the festival in 2019. So this was like the prototype thing. And um, so that project eventually became um, Materia Ondulatoria, which was my first um, full dome video. So from that prototype to the final uh, video we did, we learned a lot. And I actually started using Touch Designer for video creation with this project. Um, the whole concept was around how matter behaves and the duality between particles and waves. And so we did like lots of different moments and we used different tools so i'm going to show you like a couple of couple of moments from the film so we had some particle systems made with touch designer um, and we also got to work with some great sound artists here in 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 bogota and we were playing with how we like create different sensations for the public or the audience. So as, as Jen was saying, you can create like some dizzy motions, but also some very pleasant ones, uh, like the sense of traveling and moving and rotating can generate some really cool uh, feelings when you're inside of the projection. Um, so yeah, this was also using Max MSP, uh, which uh, my friend Pierre is really good in, and we uh, this was all pre-rendered, and it was also 4K resolution, lots of displacement and and playing around and seeing what we could come up with. Mm. Okay, so this was kind of the mood boards. I I we did like the whole storyline of how we wanted to portray this abstract story and what kind of uh, visuals we wanted to have. 
Mm, and this is some of the behind the scenes. We did some we did some Lisa Ju Partons recording. So we had like this subwoofer connected to like uh, uh, how can I say that like 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 a balloon, cotton balloon, and we had this laser pointed at it, and we were recording the output of that. We had lots of these little patterns, and then afterwards we used those to mix it up and, and, and do the final composition. This is some of those particles I showed you earlier, just putting a camera, having those particles come at it, and having the camera just as uh, Jules uh, showed us earlier. And this is some of the experimentation with Max MSP, uh, like doing live. We did live recordings of ourselves, even if the final project was all pre-rendered. Some of the things were built using interactivity for the recordings. Mm, okay. And these are, these are some of the still frames. So that was like the first uh, project I had the chance to work in in uh, dome format. Um, and next year in 2020, we got to make like a little snippet. Well, I got to make a little snippet for uh, the world exposition in Dubai. Like every country had a video and this is like the biggest dome they have over there. And this was like crazy resolution. It was more than 8K. And so I got to do some cute particle systems really based on the things I learned with the, with the previous project. Um, and so this was like a, like a project where we worked several people. We had um, lots of footage of birds here from Colombia and some images inspired by uh, a, a community of indigenous people, which, which are called the Inga. And I did some particle systems at the end, which were based on um, some orchids and some flowers with, with the colors of our flag. And after I did that, I was really hooked on making fun stuff for domes. So every now and then I just boot up touch designer and make like a little quick sketch of something and render it out in, in a full dome and imagining how it could look in the, the planetarium. Um, so yeah, these are some tests that I did with having like the cold noise and flowers and stuff. And afterwards I did this, um, this small experiment of how, we, how I could like make some blobs inside of, of a dome. And little did I know that like a year later, I would have the chance to expand on this uh, idea and this project with some very smart and creative people. And this small experiment became um, this project, which is called El Macroscopio, which is an interactive full dome installation we did. Um, with a collective I'm part of, which is called Proyecto Aurora. Um, so it's composed out of me, uh, Sebastian Hernandez, which you can see over here on the left, and Santiago Caicedo, which is in the middle. Um, and we did this uh, for uh, an art, like a, an art exhibit we have here in Bogota, which is called Voltaje. And they, um, this year, 2022, they, were going to be based on Bogota's planetarium. And they wanted to make something interactive, so they reached out to us and we did this um, helmet thing. Uh, and you can manipulate the matter I was showing earlier. We obviously worked a lot in improving it and having interactivity. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of how it looked like and Let me see if I can get some sound in this. Where was 
it share sound? Share sound, okay. So, as you can see, um, the, the interactivity is um, made with a new motion sensor, and each hand controls different aspects of this uh, fluid simulation. Um, so, with your right hand, you can actually move the camera and rotate it, and with your left hand, you can um, change different parameters of the of the of the, of the fluid. And um, closing each hand creates like a different force force field for those particles. And <clears throat> what we did was to um, smooth out those signals as much as we could. And what was really interesting was that, um, OK, so I'll show that in a bit. Um, people really started having like these beautiful hand movements, and it became like almost a choreographic performatic thing. Um, we had from little children to old people play around with it uh, during the festival. And we actually got invited afterwards to another event in the dome to show it again. So here is a little bit of behind the scenes of how the project came to be. Um, before really hooking up the leap motion and stuff, uh, we were working a lot with having interesting dynamics and uh, like a controlled number of parameters that we wanted to play with, because if not, it would become really crazy. So this is, if, I don't know if you've played with the lead motion before, but that's like what the camera sees. And <clears throat> we hooked up the lead motion to, the, to this helmet. And it was just some fun late night prototyping and, and finally, this is how it looks like. It's all running real time from a laptop and we're managing almost 4K, but not quite in, in real time. So I was just behind the scenes in the dome and we had the helmet and people would come up uh, to play with it. Um, yeah, so just, I was telling, just as I was telling you what was, really fun about it was seeing how people, different people interacted differently and how the system could create like things we didn't plan necessarily, but turned out um, interesting. And yeah, so the last thing I, I wanted to talk to you about was a, a full dome workshop we did afterwards. This was done with Santiago Caicedo and myself and oops, I'm sorry, over here, it should say Jorge Bandera. Um, and we had like something around a dozen students come up. We did some really quick photogrammetries of themselves and we taught them how full DOM works, how the DOM master is set up, how we can use touch designer to render it out. And we had like a, a final day where we, where we had a Kinect and some other sensors and we were we had the dome open for us and we were able to make some quick uh, prototyping visuals for the dome in real time. And so we're trying to push interactivity for these domes and teaching people how they can create content in real time and how they can input signals out of different sensors and have it all 
in this immersive environment. So yeah, that was what I wanted to share with you today. This is my contact also. If you want to reach out to me or if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I also want to thank William and Music Hackspace for hosting this. And yeah, 